So originally, when the program went out a month ago or more, I was talking about mining and health. And then I came in and said I should probably talk about RiskGate um, because that's probably more related to training and workforce, knowledge management. I will touch on both in this talk, depending how much time I've got. Do you need me to talk into the speaker, into the mic? I can, if you do. Um, I'm sure you can all hear me. I've been, got a big, loud voice. So I'm at the SMI, Sustainable Minerals Institute, which is part of the University of Queensland. There are seven centres in the SMI at the moment, covering a broad range of areas, including the Centre for Coal Seam Gas, Water, Social Responsibility, and then MISC, which has a focus around education and training with respect to risk management and other oh and S issues. So that's an outline of my talk. I will start with RiskGate. What is RiskGate? Uh, in the introduction, ACARP was mentioned, which is the Australian Coal Association Research Program. It's a five cent levy per tonne on every tonne of black coal that is produced in Australia. That goes into a big research bucket Grants are submitted and the winning grants are selected. And it's a very collaborative fashion between the industry and the researchers to figure out that funding program. ACARP put up at the end of 2010 a process to start RiskGate going. We went through a scoping exercise with the industry to determine what that meant. And the real goal was to build what we're calling now a body of knowledge around the management of risk in coal mining. Each of the member companies nominated experts to the different topic areas, and then we went through a workshop process. The industry thinks that RiskGate is the online system that they look at when they want to go and find information. For me, it's actually three parts. It's the process that we use, the action research workshops, to develop that information. It's the content, which is the knowledge that we capture from the experts. And then, of course, it's the information system that we've built to deliver that. I mention that because those three parts are now quite well established. We know how to do it. There was a few teething exercises back in 2011 for us to learn that process as we worked with the industry. But we've got it down pat now. I think that process could be applied to many other industries which want to build a body of knowledge around particularly challenging issues. Why RiskGate? We've heard a number of speakers today talk about the mobility, the age, the job hopping that happens within mining, even though it's getting less under the storm clouds over the industry. The coal industry in particular are really the Australian coal industry, are global leaders in managing risk, and they want to take that to the next level, and they believe that can, they can be supported by sharing information across the industry. And then I like the whole matrix of knowns and unknowns. Ring a bell with anyone, I see some smiles. Can I ask what you're thinking? Oh, I thought you might be thinking Donald Rumsfeld. I lived in the US for 25 years and there's an extremely famous uh, interview with Darth Vader at the time of, uh, I think it was 9-11, where he's talking about knowns and unknowns. It's very funny. Go on YouTube, put in, don't put in Darth Vader, put in Donald Rumsfeld, known and unknowns, and you'll get the clip. It's, it's really good. So as I said, the Australian mining industry has a really enviable record, as far as the rest of the world is concerned, in reducing the number of fatalities and in reducing frequency rates of injury. Um, this is largely because of the tripartite structure between the industry, the unions and the government, and the fact that re regulations were changed in the late 1990s, early 2000s, to really focus the whole process around risk and the management of risk. Yet, even though they have a memorable record, if you look at high potential incidents, records which they are required by law to report, 
and this can apply to many different things, it's sort of a flat line. And that's sort of partly because we're humans and it's partly because knowledge isn't there to uh, try and <coughs> take care of those incidents before they happen. So from my perspective, mining's a very old industry and where things go wrong is not so much the things that we do not know or the things we don't know that we don't know it's all the things that we do not we know that we don't know those are not the big issue the big issue is here where things that we do know are forgotten because time goes by the person's not there because he's on a FIFO roster or it's something which happens relatively rarely and it happened 15 years ago and hasn't happened since and that knowledge is not there so what we want to do with RiskGate is basically capture that knowledge. Part of the answer to that is RiskGate and make that knowledge accessible 24-7 in a way that's easy to use, uh, easy to navigate, and of course you can't get something online you know, way underground, but you certainly can get it on the surface almost anywhere in the world. The way some of the colleagues I've worked with in the industry call this, it's like I can do my risk assessment in my office. I can bring the knowledge of the whole industry into the room with me when I'm doing that risk assessment. It's something that's not been available to them before. Different companies look at different things. People have different sets of experience. And when you put all that knowledge together, you have the ability to then take that knowledge through this system and take it from the old minds in the room and put it into the young minds. How does RiskGate work? RiskGate is structured about something around something called bow ties. Um, any of you in the risk game or risk management, operational management, anyone used bow ties before? Ha! Ah, so I've got one taker. Okay. Bow ties are very, very simple way. It's not the most technically complex engineering way to solve, to address an issue. But it's a simple way to get a whole lot of people in a room and talk about a problem. What you've got in the middle is the point at which control is lost. This is not the consequence. You know, the pit being flooded or the wall falling down. This is where things are starting to happen. And there's a lot of conversation in any workshop as it starts around how we define this. On this side you have the causes, on that side you have the consequences, and there's two different types of controls. There's the controls you put in place that will prevent the event from happening. There's the controls that you put in place that will minimise the consequences. For me, the best example of a mitigating control versus a preventive control is a seatbelt. It's never going to prevent you having a traffic accident, but it will hopefully minimise the consequences. Because mining's a little more technical, we didn't put a seatbelt here, we put a parachute, but it's essentially the same thing. The way to develop a topic involves a number of, sort of number of steps, a process. Initially, of course, you identify what you're going to do. Then we recruit the experts to come into that room. And then we go through the workshop process. Whoa. Uh, I'm not going to go all the way backwards. I tried to get the arrow. We define the topic, what's in it, what's not in it. We define the causes and the consequences. We figure out what the controls are. Then it goes to an expert review. It goes through a legal review, because this is an industry body of knowledge. Then it's usability testing with the experts that are provided to us by the industry, novices as well as people who are involved in the workshops. And then we do want to have a living body of knowledge. So it's structured in a way that if people want to give us feedback, we want feedback. We can add that in. Anything which comes in, we throw it back to our experts. Is this something we missed? Should we change it? Should we do something? 2011, 
we worked on these six topic areas. They're also on the back of my shirt, although the logos have been upda updated since we got the shirts made. Um, that's what we did in 2012, and this is what we're doing in 2013, this year. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of experts. The industry has supplied over 400 days of mining engineer time to put this together. And those of you who are in the HR game can put some dollars onto that because you know better than me what those people get paid. Fires, strata control, ground control, tires, isolation, collisions. Some of these are quite mining specific. Things like strata control and ground control. Explosives underground might have an application in tunneling, but probably not many other places. However, things like manual tasks, slips, trips, falls, occupational hygiene, fires, collisions, isolation, tyres, are quite common hazards in many, many other high-risk industries. Construction, transportation, oil and gas. So we think that this body of knowledge could be used in other areas, could be adapted through a workshop process to tailor it. And we'd also like to think if we get into other areas, we could probably learn things from other industries which we can then bring back to improve the risk gate coal body of knowledge. Next year, we're going to do health and well-being. It's going to be a real challenge to try and get people to agree what is health and well-being from the point of view of risk gate. Is it obesity? Is it fatigue? Is it rosters? Is it FIFO? I don't know. I don't define what these things are. The industry tells me what they're going to be, then we find the experts, and then we fill out the knowledge. A little bit of what the system looks like. When you come to the home page, and this is always going to change when we add more topics, uh, you can go up here and get a whole list of the topics, or you can just click on these different icons. When you click on an icon, you come to the topic page. There's a definition of what is in the topic. This risk aid topic area relates to hazards associated with people slipping or tripping at ground level or on stairs, ladders, platforms, and so on, and so on, and so on. And what it includes, and then when you expand this, it'll tell you what it doesn't include, and so on. Each initiating event, then, is a specific area of content within that topic. So this is about people moving on surfaces, platforms, ramps, or stairs. It would be me walking here. Very specialised area, loss of balance during access and egress to mobile plant. So falling off the stairs of that haul truck. Fall from mobile temporary or fixed plant. So this is where you need fall arrest and uh, that kind of control. So it's basically divided up into those areas and each topic has its own divisions. When you click on one of those initiating <coughs> events, so this one was loss of balance during access egress from mobile plant, then you get a whole list of causes over here. When you click on a specific cause, then the preventive controls for that cause will open up. You click on a different cause, you'll get a different set of preventive controls. See this little email icon. If you want to send back to me, I'd like to change that. I'd like to add something. There's something missing. With each particular data element, you can send me your comments or send the team that doesn't come into my mailbox. Um, so then, if you want more information about one of these, you click on the uh, information button or just on the text and that will then expand and give you a very detailed set of controls around what this means. Require mobile equipment access system design which utilises the task-based risk assessment and so on, minimises the risks identified. Apply site-based standards, clarify mining company individual and corporate procurement responsibilities. Essentially, address the slip trips falls before you buy the haul truck. Um, for service equipment, use guidance from here, design steps and so on. Now, each risk aid topic has its sort of categorised way of sorting the information. 
Often it's design and then operation and then training awareness and competency. Other times it might be the life cycle of the asset. So when the tire is transported to plant, when it's stored, when it's handled, when it's fitted or maintained, and when it's used in operation. That's the way the tire topic's broken up. They're all different. Collisions is quite interesting. Collisions is loss of control of mobile plant. So that includes the truck you know, moving by itself because the brakes didn't work or chocks or something. It's quite broad. It's not just the truck hitting something else. And then the other initiating event with collisions is it's not quite loss of control of human being, but that's essentially what it means. It's the person in the wrong place at the wrong time. And how do you put controls over that pedestrian who gets squashed because the whole truck operator doesn't see them? And that's what that whole topic is about. So there's, uh, there's a lot of debate within the groups when they put these together. Then, okay, you click the checklist button up here and then you get your take home checklist. And we've now developed to the point where you can actually get an XML file which will interface with Stature. Stature is one of the information systems that several of Australia's largest mining companies use as their internal risk management uh, process. So you can go pull the Stature file, it'll interface with Stature. When you're doing your risk assessment on site, you can pull the industry's knowledge into the room with you. It's a lot of information in these topics, a breakdown across the, the number of initiating events, the number of causes, the preventive controls, all the way through uh, almost 20,000 points of data now because we've got this year's topics which we're building which are not on the table yet. What does it take to build a body of knowledge? Um, that's just the number of workshop days and the number of industry days of participation. Anglo-American, almost 100 days of people donated to this process. Extrata, Peabody, Centennial, BMA, BHP, Rio Tinto, and then a couple of the smaller miners in uh, Queensland. This doesn't count the regulator input or the supplier input, tyre manufacturers, explosives companies. It's just the mining industry or the number of days of ma uh, person time taken to um, build each one of these topics. Opportunities. This is a body of knowledge which can be used in training. Not only around how to manage risks in a particular area of hazard, but also in just principles of risk management and bow tie analysis. Anglo-Americans using it quite a lot now to bring people up to speed in how bow ties work. It's a base of knowledge, of course. Beyond Australian coal, we see opportunities to take it into coal in other parts of the world, take it into metal mining quarries, and then beyond mining other areas of heavy high risk or heavy industry, such that one could take that coal knowledge and basically apply it to other parts of the energy chain. The manufacturers of the equipment, construction, power stations, marine shipping, and so on. Okay, I'm going to switch gears. In my night job, I'm trying to build an emerging area of research around what I call mining and health. This is not so much occupational health and safety because there's many very good people who already do that. This is more around broader questions. And one thing which we've put together to try and figure out where we're headed is something I call Lomlok. It's not Lombok. It's not the island in Indonesia, just so you remember it. It's not Lombok. It's Lomlok. And that is a matrix where we put the, in the life of the community, we put the mine, then the workers, residential or non-residential, the families, residential or non-residential, the mining community, larger community, the indigenous communities and the region. So it's just a way of, of looking in a geographical sense how far away you move. And then across in a temporal series you've got basically your life of mine. So this is your exploration, construction, operation, decommission, closure. And we've 
done an analysis of the literature, almost all of the literature which is out there around health and mining is here and in the operational phase. What that, and I don't have that slide, but what that really shows is there's an opportunity to do some serious work around health in, say, the construction phase, or even health in the exploration phase, health in closure and post-closure. Long distance commuting. I don't know why Australia has such an obsession with fly in, fly out, but it certainly leaves a lot of raw source material which we can look at as researchers. And we've started to analyze the submissions, 276 of them, I think. I might have that wrong, but some, somewhere around that. Submissions to the federal inquiry in terms of the different themes that they talked about. Um, we extracted specific themes out of all of those and then we grouped them. You can see of the over, you know, 1,050 themes we pulled out, 940 of them were negative about 154 positive. We mapped this with respect to just the health themes and you, across the different stakeholders, business, community, government. And you can see there's quite a difference in the amount of feedback in these different areas. This is an ongoing project. Um, hopefully it will be done. We'll try and bring some meaning to the way this is distributed. We've also, at the end of last year, done a um, long distance commuting survey. This was actually on behalf of one of the service companies who came to us and said, could you do this? Through uh, certain circumstances, we ended up with a rather unique population that we surveyed. We ended up with the professional end of the business or I think uh, Jeff referred to them this morning as the salaried uh, part of the workforce. And so, and this was mainly because we got the survey out through associations like AusIMM, Women in Mining, um, those kinds of professional groups. Uh, it wasn't quite 50-50, but you can see that this split between male and female is not reflective of the industry as a whole, but it gives us some great information to look at. Most of these people, more than three quarters, were in a relationship. About a quarter had children and nearly three quarters have a bachelor degree or a postgraduate degree. Mode of commuting, lots of fly in, fly out, a little bit of mix and more than half are commuting more than a thousand kilometers to get to their job. And again, quite uh, professional roles and 62% uh, between 100 and 200,000 in terms of income. Satisfaction. The 50% line is here. So everyone is above the 50% line in all these different factors. 88% of people quite satisfied with salary. 87% with the commute, 86% with the job in general, team relationships, length of shift, job security, workplace accommodation, and so on. These people are essentially relatively happy with the work they're doing and the, um, and the workplace. But given that, and this is very interesting given Jeff's information this morning, some of the other speakers, 43% in terms of their future job intention, want to leave the job they're in to the same employer, leave but the same industry, and of that 11 of them leave for a different industry. And the time frame for the intention to leave, less than six months, 40% of people. Even though 86% are perfectly happy, they're still intending to leave. Now this survey was taken before the storm clouds came across the industry. And it would be very interesting to look at what the response would be today compared to the response between uh, late September and December last year, or January this year, really. If we look at accommodation now, 
This is a breakdown of the availability of different types of accommodation, <laughs> services, facilities, recreation, room conditions. I know you can't read this. Um, I apologize for that. But things like laundries, carports, mess, wet mess, uh, on-site shop, gym, games room, computers. Uh, this report will be out in early July. Uh, let me know if, just give me your card if you want to see it. Or watch the, the SMI website. But what's interesting is we asked people regarding these different amenities, whether it was important to them or not, and then we were able to do an analysis looking at whether the amenities were wanted and whether the, they were provided. And if you're in the business of doing accommodation in this industry, this is useful information. On this side of the line is things that people really want but are maybe not always provided. Internet access really sticks out. Another one here is exclusive use of a room. The same room. Th this privacy, having your own room, that sense of your own personal space is important if you're away on roster. On the other hand, what's provided but really not very important. So less than 40% of people wanted anything on this graph. Here's wet mess. Given that the industry has to some degree a reputation of all these fly in, fly out people being drunk and you know, out of control, the fact that less than 40% of them want wet mess, even though it's provided at 90% across these accommodation f facilities, is something worth thinking about. So the bottom line, having a private shower and toilet, really important. Air conditioning, having the same room each roster cycles, important. Of course, eating, mobile phone reception, uh, internet should be on there as well. When we, in another part of the survey, looked at health and well-being, <laughs> 83% of people are really quite satisfied with their life. In terms of work-life balance, demands of the job make it difficult to form or maintain relationships. Most of them disagree. Stress from home does not interfere with work life. Some things at home do not get done, and so on. It's, it's really not that bad. Opportunities. We've developed a reference data set now of over 300 responses. We can apply this in different sites, different companies, different kinds of industries with respect to people's uh, input around accommodation and also the job roster, the, the work-life balance they've got. We could do this in a time series. So if you're setting up a fly-in, fly-out operation, you could do it at the beginning, six months later, 12 months <coughs> later, just to get a check of how everybody feels. Come and talk to me. We're very interested in expanding the data set and just seeing how we can use this instrument. So in summary, talked a little bit about RiskGate. Um, and then we talked about the long distance commuting project. So thank you very much. A lot of people went into doing this work. And uh, I'm happy to talk with you about it. I have two minutes.